Hey everybody, welcome to another theory webinar. Um, today's webinar focuses on fortified wines of the world, of course, with a special focus in the archetypal uh, fortified wines of Port, Madeira, and Cherry, but also um, the wines from around the world that those three categories have influenced. Um, so we'll take a look at production styles um, at those regions in particular, and then we'll kind of filter through some of the other regions of the world and styles of wine that again are influenced by those. Uh, we won't get super deep into all of them because that would take forever. I do think this is gonna be a long presentation. It's got about 60 slides or so. So we start with um, dessert and fortified wine styles. So for fortified, you basically, um, based upon when you decide to add the fortification will be the desired style of wine, right? So wine's known as Vindu Naturel, uh, which is fortification after some fermentation. Typically, um, you'll want some sugar to remain. You'll see that in the styles of port, right? They do it at the beginning so that some sugar remains. Um, you won't see it in sherry. Well, you will sometimes. Um, sherry though, typically is fully fermented. Um, meaning that you'll have dry wines at the end of, uh, of the fermentation and fortification. Madeira is done during the beginning or the end basing, uh, based on how much sweetness you want to have in the fin finished product. Marsala can be done during or after fermentation. Um, if you decide to fortify prior to fermenting, it's known as a mistel. Um, these were once known as vins de liqueur, but the EU has adopted that term for all fortified wines. The most famous of those are the Mistel wines of France. Uh, you'll find them as Ratafia in Champagne, Pinot de Charente in Cognac, Flotte de Gascon in Armagnac, and Macvin de Jura in Jura. You could also make dessert wines, of course, out of naturally um, natural sweetness from the grape, uh, from dried grapes or botrytized grapes and other things. We won't be focusing on those styles today. So four main questions that you can ask yourself when we talk about a fortified wine. When does the fortification occur, right? Does it occur before fermentation, at the very beginning of fermentation, at the very end of fermentation? Does it occur after fermentation? What are you fortifying it with? Um, is this a high alcohol content, neutral grape spirit? Um, is it brandy? Is it cognac? Um, are you using, um, you know, older sherry and then neutral grape spirit in a 50-50 blend, as you'll see there, and mitad y mitad? What's the ABV of that fortifying spirit? right? Is it 50%? Is it 77%? Is it 96%? And why are they fortified, right? So in the case of Port and Madeira, of course, um, these wines needed to be strengthened before they went out on their ocean journey. Um, sherry, of course, probably the same thing at the beginning, but is sherry fortified for that reason today, or is it because they want to find certain styles um, that they're aiming for with it? We'll take a look at each of those. We start, though, um, in Portugal, in northern Portugal in the Douro Valley uh, for the Porto DOP. Um, you can see here uh, where Oporto and Villanova de Gaia, the famous area for where shipping comes out, right off the Douro River. But really, the main areas for growing the grapes are further inland, where it's a more continental climate. The Porto DOP has three sub-regions, the Baixo Corgo, the Sima Corgo, and the Douro Superior, and you can see those west to east here. Now, uh, you can see, too, You've got a bunch of mountains around it, right? So you've got the Montemuro and Marau Mountains that uh, the valley sort of flows through. The Douro certainly does. You also have Serra de Alvau and the Serra de Bornes over here. Uh, and then of course it abuts Spain, right? And you can see major areas here, Pinhão, uh, Villanova de Faz. Pretty cool. The history of port uh, first demarcated in 1756 um, due to fraudulent winemaking. And you can even still see today, uh, it's only been recent that law changes have been enacted to say, hey, you can't call these wines port, right? It's kind of like champagne outside of champagne, right? Um, it's run by the Instituto, Instituto dos Vinos de Duro y Porto, the IVDP, uh, which overtook in 2003 the Interprofessional de Regia de Mercado de Duro, which came online in 95, that overtook the Casa de Doro that came online in 1932, so on and so forth. There's actually one more behind that in the 1800s. Uh, but it was really the Treaty of Windsor in 1386 that led to opening up of those maritime trade routes um, that meant that their wines were now gonna have to be strengthened in order to get them out and ship them. Uh, the region has seen malaria, powdery, and downy mildew, and phylloxera. Malaria is an interesting case. 
Um, and in fact, I'm gonna just jump back to the screen real quick. This is a picture that I took there in 2013. It's probably the most beautiful place I've ever been. Uh, but you can see that um, you have a lot of terraced slopes where the vineyards are. They're not so much down by the river and the case being uh, originally that people wanted to get away from mosquitoes and they didn't want to have malaria. So they planted their vines higher up. It's kind of interesting. There's some other reasons to it too. Um, there is a phenomenon known as the Douro Bake, where, where you are in the Douro River, it's far more continental and a lot warmer. Uh, and so they would ship their barrels out to Villanova de Gaia in the spring to avoid baking the wines in the hot summer. Now, this ceased to be mandated in 1986 with modern climate control. Coming online, most of the wineries keep their barrels uh, at the winery themselves. I mentioned that it's continental. Uh, it's hot summers and very cool winters. All of those mountains act as a barrier to the humid Atlantic winds, um, getting drier the more inland you travel. Um, the dry weather is preferred for the root development up to 26 feet deep in the east. Rainfall here is 35 inches a year in the Baixa Corgo in the west. Um, 20 inches in the Sima Corgo and then 26 inches in the Douro Superior. Uh, with the wettest and coolest area, Baixa Corgo is the most densely planted and most known for bulk port, whereas the Sima Corgo has uh, more of your fine port houses and, and vineyard sites. So you'll see those when we get to um, a few of those down when we get to producers. Um, as far as aspect, geography, and soil, um, 60 degree slopes, you saw those in the pictures there's schist and that's what you want. Um, this helps to avoid, again, we mentioned uh, malaria and mosquitoes um, that the locals set it above the rivers on the slopes. Um, you have south and west facing vineyards that produce the strongest must. The higher elevations tend to be lighter. Um, there is some granite and the Marau and Montemiro mountains, but that's not as important. Schist is what you want for port. As far as wine laws are concerned, there's a few, the late Tergo which restricts a house to one third of their annual production um, being released, right? There's also the beneficio, which is used two different ways in uh, discussing port. Uh, the first is the maximum amount of wine that may be fermented in a given year. And this is scored on a 2,361 point scale. Uh, 1,200 points is, a, is an A, and the scale goes from A all the way to I. Uh, but if you're G or lower, you can't actually label it as port. Uh, these, these are vineyard sites that are scored upon 12 criteria, right? Known as the Marrera de Fonseca. Um, so the soil and climate factors, there's seven of those. Location, altitude, exposure, bedrock, rough matter, slope, and shelter. And then your vines are actually scored, the other five, under type, planting density, yield, training system, and the vine age. And of course, the higher classifications fetch the higher prices here. As far as the grapes are concerned, it's got to be 60% preferred. You can see the list of all the preferred reds here. Tariga Nacional, Tariga Franca, Francesca, Tinto Roriz, um, sort of rule the roost here. Uh, preferred whites for white port are Guveo, Malvasia Fina, Biosinho, and Rabigato. There's a couple of others as well that are important to know. Viticulturally, um, these wines are hand harvested. The reds, uh, as far as Yield is concerned or limited to 55 hectoliters per hectare, whereas whites are at 65. Uh, they're typically on those breathtaking steep terraces that we saw in that one picture. Um, today you'll see Patamarish, which are wider terraces where you can utilize tractors. Uh, and then there's also Vinos Alta that plant against the grain. They go straight up the slope and you can see a picture I took of it here uh, on the same trip. You just go straight up the slope. This improves the density, the ripening, and can aid in mechanization if it's uh, less than a 30 degree slope. The process of port, uh, we start and we think of the lagarish. These are the open granite troughs for foot crushing of grapes. Typically that's automated today, although Taylor famously, famously still uses foot treading. Um, fermentation is two to three days to maximize the extraction of color. Once that's done, it's pressed off and fortified once a third of the sugar has been converted to alcohol. And here it's per, uh, fortified with aguardente, a 77% alcohol by volume uh, neutral grape spirit, and a one to four ratio in a process here also known as beneficio. Um, you can use that synonym as mutage in other parts of the world. Meaning that the final wines are gonna reach between 19 and 22% alcohol. 
It's produced by pouring the partially fermented uh, juice into a tank that's a quarter filled with chilled aguardente. Super simple, right? Uh, styles of port, you've got ruby and you have tawny and you can see a picture I, I put up just in general. You'll find your rubies tend to be a more opaque color, whereas your tawnies have that uh, more nutty sort of color to them. The rubies, uh, no vintage date, often uh, age one to three years in varying mediums. Ruby reserve means it's more complex than regular ruby. Okay, thanks for giving us that. Uh, vintage though is, is the gold standard, right? This encompasses, encompasses one to 3% of the total production and it's only produced in declared vintages. And it's bottled between the second and third year after the harvest. Then you get single quinta vintage port. This is a product of a single estate from a single vintage. It's made in the same fashion as uh, vintage ports. Uh, you also have LBV, which is late bottled vintage. This wine carries a vintage date, but it's aged for an extended period uh, in oak, four to six years. A lot of these are filtered prior to bottling and they're a great match for dark chocolates. Um, and then three years in bottle aging are required. Uh, and then you have your tawny styles. These are aged for a significant time in oak and they can be a blend of several vintages. Um, some terminology here, your reserve tawny means seven plus years of oak. Tawny with an indication of age, this can be 10, 20, 30, and sometimes 40 years in oak. Um, listed on the label, the age indication is indicative of a style, not the actual age of the wines um, it contains. So Wars Odoma 10 year, uh, grams 20, grams 30. It just means that the wine's not necessarily 30 years old, but it tastes like what the IVDP determines a 30 year old wine should taste like. Um, Colhetsatani is a uh, vintage dated port that spends at least seven plus years in oak. And then you have Garifira, which is moved, removed from the cask between three and six years and aged for sometimes decades in these glass demijohn bottles. So terminology we mentioned, beneficio means both the maximum yield allowed as well as mutage or the act of arresting fermentation. You'll also find crusted port. This is a blend of multiple vintages that is bottled early enough to show sediment. Um, not, I haven't seen one of these in quite a while actually. Um, Envelhesido and garrafa, which means three or more years of bottle aging. And then you get some sweetness designations that they can carry as well, extra seco is 17 and a half to 40 grams of residual sugar. Uh, seco 40 to 65, mayo seco 65 to 85, dolce 85 to 130, and muto dolce 130 plus. Um, as far as pipes are concerned, the shipping barrels, um, the pipe in the Douro is 550 liters, uh, 620 liters in Villanova de Gaia, and the shipping pipe is 534 and a quarter liters, essentially. Food pairing, uh, in general, port and chocolate kind of hate each other, um, which I know we think of that as going well together, but um, they both have tannin and they operate in the same portion of your palate and they typically clash. Um, of course, um, Ruby Port and LBV can stand out as being, okay, these can work with chocolate. Uh, Ruby Port also great with tart fruits. LBV also great with cheese. Vintage Port is really amazing with nuts and stronger cheeses. Tawny is great with creamier cheeses and stone fruits and white port uh, famously served there with almonds. And a lot of times they'll do uh, white port and tonic. It's quite delicious. As far as producers are concerned, there's a few that stand out. Um, German uh, in descent that was founded in 1638 is Kocki. Um, the English, of course, played a big role in these wines. And there's a few that were established in the 1700s, Wars, Croft, and Taylor. And then those that produce also table wine, Nieport, Quinto do Crosto, Ferreira, and Ramos, and then uh, Quinto do Noval, too. I wanted to go ahead and point out the grade A from the Beneficio, single quintas of note from different producers. And so what I did was I made a grid here. This is the producer. Um, this is the area that the single quinta is in, and then this is the name of the single quinta. And so it can kind of help you figure out what the most important single quintas to really recall are. Um, quinta du Noval, of course, has Quinta du Noval in Cima Corgo. Um, Nieport has Quinta du Napolis in Cima Corgo. Taylor has Quinta du Vargelis, uh, where they occasionally also produce Vargelis Vignavela from their 80 to 120 year old vines there. Uh, that's in the Douro Superior. Uh, they also have Quinta de Terra Faita, and Quinta de Junco in Cima Corgo. Kopke has Quinta de Sao Luis in Cima Corgo. 
uh, Grams has Quinta do Malvedos, and then they have uh, two subplots known as the Stone Terraces, where they'll make a single wine out of that too on occasion. Uh, for Ramos Pinto, you have Quinta do Ervamora and Doro Superior. Dallas has Quinta do Bonfim. I've actually that was where that picture was from earlier in the in the show in Cima Corgo. Um, and then they have Quinta Signora de Ribera and the Duro Superior. Fonseca, famous for their Quinta du Panascal and Cima Corgo. Uh, Wars, beautiful, Quinta du Cabadinha. Um, Sandeman has Quinta du Vau and Quinta du Seixo in Cima Corgo. Coburns has Quinta du Canais in Duro Superior. Uh, Churchill's has Quinta de Giricha in Cima Corgo. And then Croft, also in Cima Corgo, has Quinta du Roeda, which is often known as the jewel of the Duro Valley. So the ones that I've highlighted here, I would say no Quinta de Rueda, excuse me, um, from Croft, no Quinta de Gavadinha from Wars, no Quinta de Panascal from Fonseca, no Quinta de Bonfim from Dows, Quinta de Malvedos from Grams, uh, and then Quinta de Vargelis from Taylor and Quinta de Duval. I would say those are probably the most important. Quick aside. Why did the Carrot Vintages? I went ahead and pulled these out too, going back to the 60s. You can see um, 60, 63, 66, and 67. The 70s, you have 70, 75, 77, and 78. The 80s, there was a bunch of them. 80, 82, 83, 85, 87, 89. 90s, a bunch too. 91, 92, 94, 95, 97. Only a few in the 2000s, 00, 03, and 07. Then you get to the 2010s, you got 11, and then 14 through 18 all declared pretty widely. Uh, as far as those four questions that we talked about earlier, when does the fermentation, excuse me, the fortification occur for port? Well, it happens during fermentation, after one third of the sugars have been converted to alcohol. What are you fortifying it with? This is aguardente, which is neutral grape spirit. What's the alcohol content? 77%. Why are they fortified? To strengthen them for their trip on the Barca Rebelos, which are the ships that take the, the uh, barrels of port from Douro to the Villanova de Gaia and then out to sea. Um, other fortified styles I wanted to point out around Portugal before we move on to Madeira um, that are fairly similar. Setubal, uh, which goes in a torn of the Ahem, very similar to what you would find in Madeira, uh, with a minimum 67% Muscadel de Setubal, which is just Muscat of Alexandria. We're going to hear a lot of that guy today. Um, here you have more lengthy maceration of up to six months on the skins for muscatel. Um, and so these can be rather fragrant if you consider what muscatel is and then uh, macerating it on its skins for that long. And this is fortified during fermentation. Carcavelos is fermented dry and then fortified with vino abafado, which is partially fermented must. There's only like 25 hectares remaining of this stuff. Uh, and then in the Azores Islands, you find Pico, which is a minimum 16% ABV after fortification, fortified during fermentation. It's made from Verdello, Parento, and Tarantes. I'm going to show you each of these regions over here. Sechabel, Carcavelos, and Pico. Um, so we start here with Carcavelos, which is number 17 in Lisboa. And then Sechabal, you can see right here in the peninsula of Sechabal. And then down here, number 31 is Pico in the Azores Islands. And uh, then you also, we're going to, hey, strangely enough, we're going to look at Madeira here in a second. Pretty cool. There's a ton of other good stuff to know about Portugal. We're going to go over all that and the dry wines of Portugal in a couple weeks here, too. I look forward to, to diving into that. So next, we're going to talk about Madeira. Uh, let's take a look at the map, just to show you where it is in the world. It's actually closer, probably, um, to Morocco, just like the Canary Islands. I mean, these are, I mean how they're Spanish, you know, or Portuguese. Is beyond me, but that's what you get, right? Uh, and then this map is super cool. Um, it shows you all the different areas where they grow um, grapes all around Madeira. You can see that the exterior and the coastlines are the important areas for growing, and there's a reason for that. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but there is an extreme elevation jump right here to the center uh, of the island. And so it's very humid and you get basically a rain shadow that sits on the top of this island and it fills these little, um, they're almost like little creeks. I'm going to show them to you right here. It's on the next slide, actually. I wanted to make sure you see them. They're called levadas. They're little canals. And these flow down um, all the way to the terraces and help to irrigate the vines. It's pretty cool. 
So uh, we mentioned the Torn of Yegem uh, with uh, Muscatel de Cetribol. Um, this is the important thing for Madeira, right? These, these wines are subject to, to intense heat and motion, which makes them really quite indestructible. They can be produced here on the island of Madeira and then neighboring Porto Santo. Um, these basalt terraces that you see here are known as poyos. Um, there's super fertile volcanic soils that support tons of different crops, uh, but really important for the grapes, the pergola system rules the day. These are known locally as latadas, and they help to combat fungal diseases from the damp subtropical climate. You can see these guys working underneath the pergola right here, which I think is a great representation. They're actually fairly low. Um, these guys probably aren't super tall, uh, but they're lower than a lot of other pergola systems that you might see. And let's take a, a quick zoom in on the basalt terraces too, just so you get a, kind of a feel. Look at how crazy that is. It's great. So we mentioned that spike in elevation, um, always that cloud cover and rainfall at the center of the country that feeds those levadas. These canals run all the way down. Um, your average grower estate here is 0.3 hectare. So the IVBAM is the regulatory body here and they regulate harvest and production methods. They also uh, regulate wine, embroidery, and the Handicraft Institute. That just says something, right? So in America, we have alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And in Matera, it's uh, handbags, uh, embroidery, and wine. So just, just saying. Uh, Phylloxera landed in 1872. Um, today in Madeira, there's actually less than 500 hectare of vine because, um, well, bananas fetch a higher price. Um, there's also an interesting note here, because those growers have such small plots, you have these large production companies. These companies actually produce Madeira and there's only eight of them, okay? Uh, they are H.M. Borg in 1877, Enriquez and Enriquez in 1850. This is their founding date. Madeira Wine Company, 1913. Um, Herrera de Oliveira in 1850. Filios Barbeto in 1946. Justino, which is the largest. Uh, in 1870, Faria et Filos in 1949, and then most recently, the cooperative known as Madeira Vintners in 2013. I would know, like, you know, the oldest ones, Dolivera and Enriquez. I would know Barbito for sure, Justino being the largest, and I would know the, the newest kid on the block, Madeira Vintners. Um, there's also what we call shippers, right? And so these people will select wines from a producer, and then they'll ship it under their own brand. Broadbent is a really great example of that. Those wines are fantastic. Um, they buy them from Justino. And then there's partidistas, which we'll talk a little bit about these almas and istas and sherry, but these people will store their wine um, and then sell it at its maturity for full profit under somebody else's label. Um, the grapes of Madeira, this is an important thing to talk about. Um, you've got the 85% rule for labeling on multi-vintage, but it has to be 100% for vintage dated, okay? Um, Tinta Negra is probably the workhorse, right? It does 85% of the production and it's elevated to a recommended grape in 2015, which now allows it to be placed on labels, whereas before it couldn't. But then you have these noble white grapes, okay? Um, Cercial, which is also known as Escana Chao, driest and the most acidic. Verdello, Boal, which is also known as Bool or Malvasia Fina, and then Malmsey, which is your sweetest, which is known also as Malvasia Candida or Malvasia Bronco de Sao Jorge. Um, and you can see I made a little um, infographic here that shows you the typical residual sugar contents for Cercial, 18 to 65 grams, Verdello, 49 to 78, Boal, 78 to 96, and Malmsey, 96 to 135 grams per liter. Pretty sweet. Um, another one that's you might just want to know about, it shows up, is Tarantes. Uh, it's super difficult to, go, difficult to graft. It hasn't been replanted since Phylloxera, so there's only a handful of hectares remaining. Um, the bottlings are super rare, and the sweetness is probably comparable to what you find in Verdello. Um, but I have seen, you know, like some 1800s, late 1800s Tarantes Madeiras out there that you can get that are pretty fun to try. As far as harvest and fortification here, uh, the Boal and Malmsey are picked first, the Cercial and Verdello are last, and they're separated from their skins prior to fermentation. Here you're using a 95 to 96% ABV neutral spirit from France during fermentation. Uh, they're typically just dump it directly into the fermentation tank. 
Now, um, Malmsey may only ferment for a few hours to maintain all of those natural sugars. Then you have to talk about matterization. So after we fermented and fortified, the wine is then exposed to be heat damaged by one of two methods, uh, astufagum or cantiro. And the astufagum, this is a stain, there's a couple of ways, a stainless steel vat that circulates warm water through coils at 113 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it's held there for at least three months. This way the sugars were actually caramelized and you get that matter, matterized style of wine. Um, Armazins de Calor is a slightly softer process where rooms warmed by nearby tanks or pipes over a longer period of time. The Madeira Wine Company pretty famously ages theirs um, for sometimes over a year. Once that process is complete, the wine has to enter estagio, which is a, a 90 day period of resting before it's transferred to cask. And this basically helps it come down to ambient temperature here. Um, it may not be released until two years after the harvest. The other method is known as Cantiro, and this is cask aged for two years in lodge attics, exposing it to the natural sun warmth. Uh, these can be bottled with three years of age, and you could see an example up here at Enriquish and Enriquish, uh, up in the attic, and they're just letting these bad boys toast. Um, and then your most famous and most sought after wines, the rarest style of Madeira is known as Frascara, and these wines are typically Cantiro aged and require uh, 20 years in wood. Pretty impressive. Other styles that you'll run into um, of multi vintage blends, you'll find rainwater, mostly Tinta Negra, and typically and medium dry, maximum age of 10 years. Seleccionado is blended wine with three years, maximum of five, um, typically done in the estufagum process. Reserve means five to 10 years, special reserve 10 to 15, and this is where you get to see more Cantero. Um, extra reserve 15 to 20. And then you can also do Madeira with an age indication, right? Five year, 10 year, 15, 20. Um, and then there's Solera, the fractional blending and can Cantero method uh, with a minimum of five years in the Solera with maximum 10% drawn and 10 additions. Um, other styles that you run into, um, Fino de Cantero is just two years in wood, bottled three years after fortification. This is most likely Tinto Negra. Um, and then Fino de Estufagum can be bottled 12 months after the Estufagum process. And then you have probably your most sought after and famous. These are the vintage stick dated styles. Now, we have to remember that the word vintage is not allowed in Madeira, largely in, port, in part due to the port lobby, not wanting to be able to say this is vintage Madeira because we're a vintage port. So here they'll use the term colheta for two things. It can mean harvest and it can mean uh, basically a vintage. Um, so for colheta wines, they have to be 85% from a singular vintage. Have to be five year aged. Um, so then you get Frascara, uh, which are a single noble variety, right? One of those four noble varieties. They have to be 85% from a single vintage. They have to be Cantero method, and they're aged in glass demijohns again for decades, right? Uh, then you get Vena de Rota, Vino de Torno, and Vino de Volta, which just means it underwent an ocean journey and crossed the equator. So we'll ask ourselves those questions again, right? When, when does fortification occur? This, this happens during fortification based upon the desired sweetness level of the finished product. What are you fortifying it with? Well, this is French Aguardente at an ABV of 95%, and it's fortified that way to strengthen the wine for its Torno Viegum, uh, this, the ocean journey that is going to go on when it is exported. Um, next, we'll take a look at Sherry. Um, this comes from the province of Cadiz, um, just off the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the region outlined here in the map. Um, the Guadalquivir River up here in the northwest separates it. Um, it's got to be matured and shipped from one of the three major townships, which are San Lucar de Barrameda, Perez de la Frontera, and El Puerto de Santa Maria, right here. It's got two DO zones, and they are Jerez, de San, uh, excuse me, Jerez and San Lucar de Barrameda, which is up here outlined, you can see. Um, same map basically, right? But the latter has to be aged in San Lucar de Mar Barrameda. The DO here was established in 1933. This is three years before um, French AO season came on board, right? And then you can see this map is great because it shows you the Albariza soils that are really focused around uh, 
we're going to call it Jerez Superior. We'll take a look at that in just a second. And then the Barros and Arena soils, those are the three major soil types. We'll take a look at those in a second too. Uh, but really, this is the three, the Sherry Triangle, if you will. So Jerez is the hottest region in Spain. Um, the temperatures rise by up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit in Jerez compared to where San Lucar is in the coastal area. Um, you've got a couple of important winds here. The Levante is a hot, dry wind blowing in from the east and cooking the grapes during ripening. And then the Poniente is an Atlantic humid wind that alternates with the Levante, promoting the growth of Flor, which is a film forming yeast you can see a picture of it right here that sits on the top of the wines at a certain point in their lifespan. It protects the wine from oxygen and it also imparts um, interesting flavors that will show cakes. The soils here, there are three main ones. We mentioned Alboritza, Barros, and Arenas. If anybody's an NBA fan, uh, you might remember Trevor Ariza, Dana Barros, or Gilbert Arenas. These guys help me remember these three the Trevor Alboritza, Dana Barros, and Gilbert, Gilbert Arenas. Alboritza is known as being a chalky, porous, limestone-rich soil. These are the best cherries, right? It's moisture retentive, allowing for deep root penetration. It's concentrated on that Jerez Superior area, which is between San Lucar and the Guadalete River, which is here. We'll take a look real quick. I'll even zoom in. This is a picture of Alboritza soils that I lifted from Giltzom. Sorry, guys. And here's that superior region. Cool. Um, and actually, most of your pacos are here in Jerez de la Frontera. Barros clay, more for, fertile, but difficult to tend. And then arenas, you'll see it in more of the sandy areas, coastal areas, excuse me. The grapes for sherry are, uh, well, Palomino is the most important. Uh, otherwise known as Listan. 95% of the vineyard acreage is planted to this. It's got two sub varieties, the Palomino Fino, uh, which is great yields and disease resistance, and then Palomino de Jerez. Pedro Jimenez, um, there's actually a low amount of plantings that gave rise to the Consejo Regulador, uh, the governing body here, to allow for PX must be imported from neighboring Montilla Murillas. And then Muscatel, hey look, it's Muscat of Alexandria, mainly cultivated in the arena soils near Chipiona. The process of producing sherry, so soleo, which is the laying of the grapes on esparto grass mats for sun drying. It's really typical of Pedro Jimenez and Moscatel. Palomino would be done for less than 24 hours. Um, the Vara e Pulgar pruning method prunes alternate spurs, so one year's Vara or stick becomes next year's Pulgar or thumb. And then harvest is mainly machine and done in late August. Traditionally, these would come in, the wines are pressed under the feet of pisadores, uh, which are workers that are wearing zapatos de pizar. <coughs> Excuse me, and here's a picture of the zapatos de pizar. There are these little nails on the bottom of it that can help to break up the grapes. And then Pal Palomino Fino has got to be pressed really quickly as it's super prone to oxidation. Viticultural laws, um, 80 hectoliters per, he per hectare for a risk superior and 100 hectoliters per hectare everywhere else. But really, um, during the process of making some of the more important things to remember, uh, when your must is divided into three stages, you can get a maximum 70 liters of juice from 100 kilograms of grape. That's important to remember. Uh, there's three presses, right? So you get the free run press, the Primera Yema, which is about 60 to 70%. Then you get the press wine or the Segunda Yema, and then you get the most of the print. So this is the second press, usually reserved only for disflit. Nobody uses it. Uh, Palomino must is typically acidified with tartaric acid and then racked, which is known as desfangado, to clarify it prior to the fermentation. Here you get two stages of fermentation. You get the tumultuous initial hot and fast fermentation. And then you slow it down, you get the linta, which is cool and it takes place for weeks afterwards. After fermentation, uh, then your wine is classified and each barrel is marked. So uh, if you get a vertical slash, you're using a Palo. This is fortified to 15 to 15 and percent ABV. And these wines are destined to become Fino or Manzanilla. Uh, Gordura are with a circle and they're fortified to 17, 18%. They're gonna become Oloroso and the content 
of alcohol is not going to permit the growth of that film forming yeast known as floor that we just looked at a picture of earlier. So the wines are fortified after the fermentation and they're fully dry, right? Um, you get fortification with mitad y mitad. This is a mixture of grape spirit and mature sherry um, that acts as your fortifying agent. After the fortification, both sets of wines are transferred to old sherry butts of American oak that are 600 liters. Um, now you have to make the decision as to whether or not it's oxidative versus biological aging, right? So if you're going to have floor protection, you'll have a fresher style and it can be aged in San Lucar to be made into Manzanilla or it can just be called Fino uh, if it's done in Jerez. And then sometimes that protective floor will die off. We'll get this fluke of nature and that's known as Palo Cortado. And then if there's no floor protection, um, you get more of a nutty style. If you want it to be sweet, you'll call it cream sherry. Otherwise, you'll make it dry and it'll be oloroso. And you can see that these can also be known as amontillado. Cool. And this VOS and VORS, we'll take a look at what those things mean too. Your floor require, requires certain conditions to survive though. So after the yeast for alcoholic fermentations die off, a second set of yeasts arrive to metabolize glycerin, alcohol, and volatile acids. So you need humid air. This is where the poniente comes in. You need 60 to 70 degree temperatures. You need a lack of fermentable sugars. Well, we've already fermented it, we're good. Your ABV has to be 15 to 15 and a half percent, right? Uh, you get to that with your fortification if you need to. Your oxygen, um, the floor acts as a barrier and the wine, uh, excuse me, between oxygen and the wine and flourishes in the spring and autumn months, um, covering the wine in a white froth. In the summer and winter, it thins out and turns kind of gray. The wines that are destined for biological aging are typically grown in those Alvarezza soils and are from the Primero Yema. Oloroso wines have a tendency to come from the Segunda Yema. The biological process, there's a whole secondary set of aging known as Sobre Tablas. And this lasts anywhere from six to 12 months, during which the wine's evolution can be redirected. Classifications are here as follows. Palma, which is a fine, delicate cherry with healthy floor, usually this will be a fino. Palma Cortado, which is a more robust fino, and this could emerge as an amontillado if the alcohol content actually kills off that floor. Um, Palo Cortado, or I'm sorry, Palo Cortado is the one that kills off the floor. Uh, this is a rare style of both biological and oxidative aging. You start it off with the floor, and the wine is refortified for sober tablas to at least 17%, which kills off the floor. Um, Raya, which is characterized by weak floor, uh, the wine will be fortified to 70%, 17%, percent they are just going to call it Oloroso. And then the Dos Rias, the floor is dyed, the character is weak, typically the volatile, uh, excuse me, is highly volatile. The wines are sweetened and they're just made into cheap sherry or turned into sherry and vinegar. Here's the sherry aging process. Um, it's done in a Solera system, a fractional blending. Each tier here is known as a Criadera. Um, vintage wines are added up here at the top. For every liter of wine drawn, two of them have to remain. And the movement of wine between layers provides oxygen necessary for floor survival known as trasiago. And then solera, importantly, is a Latin term for floor. Two O's. So you can see here the base wine is on the floor, uh, yeast in the vintage batches for one to two years. And then they make some cask selections and they transfer it to the nursery. And the barrels in the top row of the solera are topped up with wines from the nursery. And then with the second row, the wines are transferred down row by row to top up lower barrels until they reach the bottom level. And then wines are gradually removed from the bottom rows to be bottled through, um, though the barrels are never completely emptied. Pretty cool. There's a ton of different um, variables when it comes to sherry. And so it can be difficult. I like to throw in these little infographics. Wine Folly does a really good job with them. Uh, this is from Sherry Notes. The alcohol range is here. Uh, Fino is usually 15 to 18 percent, but it can also become a Montiato if it gets to that 16 to 22 percent range. Um, Oloroso is fragrant, which means fragrant, excuse me, and Palo Cortado sit in the 17 to 22 percent. Medium dry, pale cream right here in the 15 to 22s. You have a minimum of two years aging in the Solera before release in three years, uh, excuse me, used to be three years prior to 2010. Those two VOS and VORS statements that we saw on Amontillado and Oloroso, um, VOS is Vinum Optimum Signatum, or very old cherry, 20 years minimum age. 
and then VORS is very old rare sherry, minimum 30 years of age. For these, uh, for every liter drawn, 20 has to remain for VOS and 30 for VORS, and it can only be done for Amontillado, Oloroso, Paolo Cortado, or Pedro Jimenez. Here's another great, I wonder if I can get all of this in one zoom, maybe not, okay, we'll not do that. Um, you can see the different grapes up here. When they come in, uh, they're harvested fresh. Over here, PX and Moscatel are overripe, typically are dried. Um, then you get pressing or mosto and filtering and rectification. Here you get pressing and filtering. Then you get complete fermentation for Palomino grapes, right? But Pedro Jimenez and Moscatel only receive partial fermentation. Then you get fortification to sit to that 15, 15, 4 with the Mitadi Mitad so they can see if they can grow floor, right? Um, PX and Moscatel, they don't care. They're going to go oxidative. So they're going to fortify up to 17 to 18 and they'll have no floor and they'll sit in the solera and then they'll go through filtration, stabilization, blending, bottling, and they'll come out as Pedro Jimenez or Moscatel labeled wines. Now the Palomino grapes at this point can either go biological or oxidative. And if they go biological um, and they're in San Licardo Barrameda, they can be called Manzanilla. If it's in Jerez de la Frontera, it's called Fino. It can become Amontillado or Palo Cortado. Um, if it goes oxidative, it's gonna be Oloroso, right? So I hope those can kind of show you the, the path to how you get there, which leads us to what we know as the Generoso styles of sherry. And there are seven of them. The first four um, are not from uh, San Lucar de Barrameda, right? So dry in style, there's a maximum of five grams per liter of residual sugar. You've got um, Fino, which was a, matured by biological aging. You've got Amontillado, which is a mature Fino with a little oxidative aging that follows that biological aging. You've got Palo Cortado, which again is a Fino that got redirected toward oxidative aging during the second cast classification in the Sobra Tablas. And then you've got Oloroso, which is matured again by oxidative aging. Uh, and then Manzanilla has its own set. Uh, Manzanilla Fina is basically Fino, although it's a little earlier harvest, lower ABV, lower fortification quickly, uh, moves a little more quickly through the Solero. You've got uh, Manzanilla Passata, which is Fino Amontillado style. And then you've got Manzanilla Olorosa. So those are your seven Generoso styles. But wait, there's more. Sherry can, be, sherry can be bottled as dry Generoso, or it can be sweetened in a process known as Cabaseo for wines with a minimum of 17.5% ABV to begin with. So your sweetening agents here are Dulce Pasa, which is Mistella, produced from sun Palomino grapes, in mo most commonly in Jerez. Uh, Dulce de Amibar, which is a blend of invert sugar and fino. Uh, and then Mistella, which is produced from the must of Sun, Moscatel, or PX grapes, which PX tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, you also have Vino de Calor, which is used to adjust the final wine with boiled, reduced syrup and fresh must. This can be done in one, two, one, of, two, um, in one of two recipes, so to speak. Sancocho, which reduces it to a third of its original volume, and a rope, which reduces it to one-fifth of its original volume. Uh, you also have Vino Generoso de Liqueur, uh, Vino Generoso, which is blended with VDN or concentrated must, right? So you get dry, medium, pale cream, and cream, and increasingly sweeter styles. Um, your medium is typically from Amontillado, and you can put things like golden milk or brown. You can see the, the English influence here. Uh, and then you'll see pale cream typically comes from Fino, and cream typically from Oloroso. Uh, you can also do Vino Dolce Natural, which is naturally sweet wine, fortified after partial fermentation instead of the full fermentation of sun grapes, otherwise known as Saleo. These are typically bottled varietally as PX or Moscatel, and they could be extremely sweet. And you can see up to 500 grams per liter, but the minimum for PX is 212 grams of RS. Dolce and Moscatel are both sitting at 160. Um, terminology, we mentioned earlier, um, almacenistas. Uh, these guys would store the wine until maturity and then sell them for profit. So we'll ask ourselves those same set of fortification questions, right? When does it occur with sherry? It occurs after the fermentation. What are you fortifying it with? Here we're using mitad y mitad, which is mature sherry uh, with neutral grape spirit. Uh, the ABV of the fortifying spirit here is quite low. 
to avoid shocking the wines. And then why are they fortified? Well, originally it was to strengthen them for long journeys. Today, now it's more to direct the wines to a particular ABV for a later classification. If you think you wanna make some Fino, then you're gonna bring it up to 15, 15 and a half. If you think you're gonna make Oloroso, you're gonna bring it up to a higher uh, ABV. The next region we're gonna take a look at is in Italy. Um, so now we've covered Portugal. Um, we've covered the island of Madeira, which counts as Portugal. Uh, we've covered um, southern Spain with sherry. Uh, this is Sicily, right? And, and just off the boot of Italy, take a closer look here, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, you can see Marsala sits to the far west of the isle. Um, you can also see the other regions of Edna, Cherasvolta, Vittorio, the DOCG there, Faro making fantastic wines, um, Malvasia di Lipari right up here, and then Pantelaria, uh, which is also great for super aged dessert wines. But Marsala stands out. Um, this is a Licoroso style with three types. There's Oro, Ombra, and Rubino. Um, your Oro and Ombra allow for the grapes of Grillo and Zonica, Caterato and Damaschino. So these are your whites, right? Rubino allows for Perricone, Calabrese, and Norella Mascalese with some white varieties in it too. Your ABVs typically 12% natural, fine is 17 and a half, and the other guys, uh, as you get to higher uh, classifications, get to 18%. Uh, residual sugars, your Seco is at 40 grams, semi Seco 40 to 100, and Dolce is 100 plus. And then you have a handful of aging requirements that can go on to it as well. Um, these are one year in oak for fine, two years for superiore, four for Reserva, uh, five for Solera, and then 10 for Stravecchio. And these are in oak or cherry. Other miscellaneous rules, the Ombra is the one that must include what's known as Mostacato, is Concia. And you can add, uh, uh, well, that's the process, adding Mostacato. It's not permitted for the Oro or Rubino, um, and the Virginia wines uh, here and here may not be sweetened. Cool. So when does it occur? When does fortification occur with Marsala? Well, it can happen during or after, if you're trying to make sweet or uh, dry styles. Uh, what are you fortifying it with? Aguardente, though here the addition of Sifone, a mistel from fortified overripe grape must may be added to adjust the color. Your ABV of the fortifying spirit here is high. And why are they fortified? To strengthen them for long journeys. Today, though, to direct the wines to a particular ABV. Um, other Spanish fortified styles, um, I guess I should have put this before when we had sherry, but this is just sort of in general. We've gone over a few of these um, in the past. You've got Malaga, which is Muscatel and PX grapes, and they could be um, Soleo or overripe grapes, or they could be fortified. You got aging requirements for these. You can see listed here, all the way down to Trans and Yeho for five years more or more. Um, you get Montel Montilla Morelos, which is right next to Sherry. Um, if you think it lends its name to the style of Amontillado, right? It's a wine from Montilla. Um, typically, these are Pedro Jimenez. They're fortified and they're unfortified. There's plenty of ripeness, and it's only dessert styles that are typically uh, fortified here. Um, a Montiato, though, you can't call Montilla Morelos Montiato, right? Just came from that region. Condado de Huelva, um, this is Vino Generoso de Licor. Um, Tarragona Classico, which is in that Tarragona region of Catalonia. It's available in Mistela, Vita Licor, Muscatel, Garnacha, or Vin Blanc, which is overripe. Uh, Rueda Dorado, becoming increasingly more rare. I've been fortunate enough to taste it a couple times at the Texom Conference. This is 100% combined Palomino Fino or Verdejo. Um, these are dry fortified and they're oxidized and they're kind of cool. Um, you also find in Penedas the Malvesi de Siquias and on the Canary Islands you'll find all sorts of vinos de liqueur. Um, I want to just throw together another slide with all the fortified wines that I can think of. There's plenty of more. Um, in Italy, you're, you know, they're known for vermouth all over the country. Um, this is fortified before or after fermentation. Um, you can add sugars and herbs to it as well. Um, typically what they do is they mix the herbs with neutral grape spirit and then they add that into the wine. Grape producers are Cocchi Americano, Carpano Antica, Punti Mez. Of course, you can get vermouth from other places in the world. Um, we know Vaya in the United States and of course Dolene famously uh, once had an AOP in Chambéry in, in France that I think has been uh, retconned. Uh, and then Barolo Quinato. 
these are again herbs macerated into neutral alcohol and added to Barolo. Uh, we mentioned those Mistels earlier for France. These of course are, are wines that are fortified prior to fermentation. Um, Champagne's Ratafia and the Charente, you have Pinot de Charente. Um, these can be Blanc, Rouge, or Rosé. They're fortified with cognac of at least 60% ABV. Uh, you can call it old if it's five years or extra old if it's 10 years. Um, Jura has the Mac Vin de Jura. Uh, it's uh, eligible to be Blanc for Chardon and Sauvignon or Rosé or Rouge for Pulsard, Pinot Noir, and Trousseau. Um, these are fortified with Eau de Vie of at least 52%. Uh, in Gascon, um, we think of Armagnac. This is Flock to Gascon. Uh, a third Armagnac with two thirds fresh grape must. These can be white and rosé only. Um, and they're made from the Colombard, Uni Blanc, and Groma and Seine grapes. And then an interesting one that we don't really think of because it's not made with wine uh, is Pomo de Normandie. Um, this is a third Calvados or apple brandy blended with two thirds apple juice. Comes in around 16 to 18% ABV. Uh, and boy, are those delicious. Uh, France also, beyond their Mistels that are fortified prior to fermentation, has a handful of Vin du Naturel wines. These are wines that are produced in a style just like port, essentially. Um, perhaps the most important is Reef Salt, um, uh, which translates in a Catalan dialect to high riverbanks. Um, these are a VDN style, and they come in ombre, granat, twill, and rosé. Ombre and twill are indications of oxidative styles. Uh, granat and rosé are a bit more reductive. If it's only the muscat, it qualifies for muscat de Reef Salt. Um, otherwise, you can use uh, Grenache and other grapes of the area. And this is really the area that found Moutage. This is Arnaud de Villeneuve in the 13th century figured this stuff out. Now, they can be Broncio by Solera, or they can be left in glass bonbon in the sun. Uh, Maori, another AOP there for Vidian styles with Grenache. Uh, Banyuls, again, Grenache. Um, this requires 50% for Banyuls and then 75%. Grenache for the Grand Cru. Uh, the Grand Cru also stipulates 30 months of aging. If it's vintage, it's labeled as Rimage uh, and dated and released typically within a year. Uh, there's also Rasto, uh, where you can do white, rosé, and red from, from the Grenache family of grapes, that being Noir, Blanc, and Brie. Um, here are your communes that are eligible are Chiran, Sable, and Rasto. And in 2011, they adopted the ombre and twill names to show their oxidative styles. Um, Blanc and Grenade are typically the fresher styles, but it can also be Roncio. And then you have Muscat de Bum de Venise. This is Muscat. Um, it's pure grape spirit, and it's at a much lower addition. Five to 10% um, is blended in. In Greece, you have a handful of areas that can be uh, Vindu Naturel, or they can be Vindu Liqueur. And they could also just be naturally sweet wines in these areas too. It's kind of hard to figure out when you're looking at the label. But if they are Vindu Naturel, um, there's a couple of different sets, right? You'll see, you'll notice here that mostly Malvasia, Malvasia um, and then Muscat are down here. So the Malvasia is blended with up to 80% addition of 96% neutral grape spirit, okay? Um, the Muscat wines have a tendency to be a lower percentage, up to 40% at a 96% ABV. And I went ahead and lined them out from where they come from, too. So you can expect that the Malvasia wines will be a bit more fortified style, right? They're going to be a little more freshness to the Muscat style wines. Uh, and then fortified styles from around the world. In Australia, you get both port and sherry styles. Uh, of course, Famously, the Rutherglen Muscat. This undergoes a short maceration, then it's fermented with tons of considerable sugar remaining with a 96% ABV grape spirit and, uh, and the port way of doing it in a one to four ratio. Um, Toke uh, is now known as Topake. It's basically the same set of rules as Rutherglen Muscat. They just utilize the Muscadel grape, which is white from Bordeaux, really the only region you see this utilized, uh, rather than the brown Muscat. Sherry style wines in Australia are known as Apera. And then there's a really famous one known as Sepult Filled Paras Liqueur. We talk a bit more about it in the Australia presentation. This is fortified to an ABV of 17% and it's Solera aged for 100 years. Pretty fantastic. 
I think they said somewhere around the 60th year, it grows to like 14 grams per liter of residual sugar. It's a very, very uh, interesting process. In Cyprus, uh, you have Commanderia. These are uh, raisined, I guess this uh, raisin Mavro and Zinisteri grapes that are aged two years. Um, sometimes the sugar here outweighs port uh, by four times. In South Africa, you find Jarapigo. Um, this is musket of Alexandria, fortified prior to fermentation, um, locally known as Hanaput. And then there was that Boburg region, which was recently removed, uh, that was for the fortified wines of Parle, French Hill, Tulba, and Wellington, made in a port style. And then, hey, check it out in Texas, a uh, great producer that, oddly enough, uh, a friend of mine, not a friend of mine, a girl that I went to high school with is the winemaker at now. <laughs> Uh, they make uh, Madeira style wines out of uh, Jacques. And that's my, my presentation today. Um, I hope you all don't get too bogged down with the minutia of fortified wine styles. Um, I wanted this to be all encompassing. There's a ton of information to look at here. Um, it's something that you should probably um, sit down and try to compartmentalize and think about. But I think it's really cool to see what port sherry and madeira did for the rest of the world of wine those wines traveled um, they follow the path of man uh, and then they were recreated all over the world and uh, i hope this helps to bring that all into into perspective cheers gang <laughs>